What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Find out every Monday at 8 on Notes from an Artist. Bassist educator, author David C. Gross, and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an Artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. Every Monday at 8 on CygnusRadio.com. And check out previous episodes on our podcast. Notes from an artist.buzzsprout.com. In terms of Chris Parker, what a thoughtful guy. Oh, uh, one of the premier drummers of his generation. You know, we talk about how his dad was a jazz drummer. He grew up in Chicago. He started his career with Paul Butterfield. How's that for a... a, a Yeah, and I had no idea he was a painter. (laughs) Exactly. Major player in the studio scene of the 1970s. We talk about that. His discography is absolutely astounding. Think of all the guys he's been in the studio and on stage with. Bob Dylan, Cher, Joe Beck, uh, Natalie Cole, Miles Davis, Aretha Franklin, Freddie Hubbard, James Brown. He was in Saturday Night Live's band. Ashford and Simpson. Ashford and Simpson, Quincy Jones, and John Cicada. Stuff. And, and now we're talking stuff. Gordon. The Ed. most important band for me. I learned so much going to McKell's to see these guys play. Legendary, legendary. Gordon Edwards, Cornell Dupree, Richard T., Steve Gadd, and uh, Eric Gale. Uh, our listeners will know that when we spoke with uh, uh, George Porter and he saw stuff and he ran backstage and says, oh my God, what are we going to do? These guys just played everything. <laughs> That's exactly right. Chris is still an active, uh, still active on the bandstand and in the studio. He has his Chris Parker trio record, which we discuss, and he's also with the uh, repertory ensemble the 60s so um this is a renaissance man who plays drum and you're gonna love all the music as a matter of fact this was so good and the commentary was wonderful but i kept putting this song and that song and this song and guess what folks we have another two-parter here chris parker part one is tonight next monday night it'll be part two so why don't we get started with mr chris parker welcome to the 21st century uh, <laughs> <laughs> here we are on zoom who would have thought it there uh, I know, it's amazing. I'm sorry it took me so long to figure out audio and showing my own picture, joining you guys. I don't do it. No, we we understand. Some folks are actually uh, at the point where they need uh, literal help from family members <laughs> to do it. So <laughs> you've passed the test. That's you, know who's, you know who was very good at it, though, Chris, is Ron Carter. We um, we did a few uh, interviews with Ron Carter, and man, he's got his own studio set up. You just say the word, and Ron is broadcasting. He's also been doing some quite interesting podcasts. He's amazing. Uh, we uh, Yeah, we enjoyed, we did a, actually a tips from the top from him, right, David? We got a free bass lesson from Ron Carter. Exactly, exactly. That's priceless. Are you back playing with uh, my friend John Cardone in the 60s uh, repertory band? Have you been doing those? Yes, we just did the first um, gig back uh, August 26th and 27th at this theater in uh, Connecticut. That was the first one in, in a while. Yeah, that's a great show. I really enjoy watching it. It's a lot of fun to play that stuff. Yeah, it's a trip down memory lane and the visuals are fantastic. David, they even dress up as per the era, so... Oh, that's great. That's great. I wish I could fit in those clothes again. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so Chris, this is your life. Let's talk. You're from a place called Chicago, which is an incredible musical hub. It's funny. We've talked to a lot of uh, British rockers, most notably 10 years after. And, you know, we think about the Stones, the Yardbirds, the Animals, John Mayle, Cream, Jeff Beck. And their home is in London. It's Chicago. It's where that music comes from. Yeah. Buddy Guy has still got a great place there. The club is uh, in full-time operation, and he's always playing. He's he's a genius. Yeah. yeah. Reflect on how that city is so influential, because when people talk about musical cities, they always talk about New York, L.A., London, Nashville, Austin, Memphis. But Chicago has it all, really. Chicago is used to i don't know uh, i haven't been there recently but they used to have you know a lot of great jazz clubs and a lot of blues clubs a lot of places to hear music some great uh ballrooms airy crown theater i remember and just seems to be conducive to playing music yeah i mean i guess it's just location just it's it's smack in the middle of the country so you get all those influences you travel in the united states you have to go through chicago at some point that's great yeah. and the guys 
Mississippi came way, and the guys from New Orleans came that way. The guys from Kansas City came there. There was a lot of recording there in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Great city. You just heard two recordings that were done in Chicago in the early 1920s. The first, Dipper Mouth Blues, which is a classic rendition with Louis Armstrong on trumpet in the King Oliver Orchestra, followed by a solo recording called The Crave by none other than Jelly Roll Morton. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Well, you came to New York in 1970 to pursue, I guess, a, a life as a studio player. But were, were you with Paul Butterfield before that? No, that was after that, wasn't it? No, I came to the city in 68, actually. I went to art school here, School of Visual Arts, 68, mm. 69, 70. And 70, I moved to Woodstock and joined a band and then soon after met Paul Butterfield. That, that was your first real professional experience with Paul traveling and touring? And things. Pretty much, yeah. The, the band I joined in Woodstock did a couple of little tours. We were the opening act for a Jimi Hendrix movie called Jimmy at Berkeley because we had the the same manager, Michael Jeffrey Hendrix. And after Jimi Hendrix passed, you know, they were trying to monetize whatever um, they could out of his career. And what was like. Now, what was the name of that band, Chris? band was called Holy Moses. That was No Turning Back, Holy Moses, released on RCA 1971. Let's get back to our interview with Chris Parker. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. One record on RCA, which was re-released on CD, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. Um, It was like country rock, a lot of straight eighth notes. Eighth notes are good, David. Eighth notes are good. Eighth notes are good. We call them num-nums. I'm sorry, David? We call them num-nums. Num, 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 num. <laughs> Put a little piece of sponge under the bridge there. And you exactly. Can... Water foam. What do you call it? Uh, Tom calls it water foam. <laughs> what? A water foam. A water foam. <laughs> water foam. Exactly. Yes. Find me a good bass player and you'll see a chunk missing out of their couch because that's that's the best sure. place to get. Woodstock was totally different in 1970 than the commercial Woodstock of today. As a matter of fact, I'm going there tomorrow to see my dentist. Oh, really? Great. You know Bruce, right? I do. Figured you would. It's a lot easier to go there um, up in Woodstock than go into the city, that's for sure. I'm up in Connecticut now. Where are you in Connecticut? Woodbury. Oh my God, I drive through there a lot. Really? Where are you located now? I have a friend who lives in Watertown, and uh, we often visit his friend, this friend, stay for the weekend, and um, Berry and Southbury, you know, that's the route. Before you get to yeah, Watertown. Exactly, exactly. And I had a house in Sherman, Connecticut, a little farther west. Yeah, Daryl had a place there too. Yep. He still has the A Pauling studio, I think. And now he lives in Millbrook or somewhere. Yeah. Oh, Millbrook's nice. Yeah, well, man. I've got a lot of things to talk to you about, okay? So I've got a list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that were really important to me when I was growing up and becoming a bass player and all that stuff. As a matter of fact, Will had me go in for some sessions, uh, subbing for him with Harold Wheeler, Paul Reiser, and folks like that. That was all happening around the exact same time. Now, one of the first things that really, um, turned me on to your play was um, Starfire on the first uh, CTI release, Joe Beck. And oddly enough, here's where this gets really funny. Down the road, Joe Beck, he lived in Woodbury. Right. And one of my daughter, who's a senior in high school starting today, is uh, living in that house. So I was over there at the pool and they said, by the way, did you ever hear of anyone named Joe Beck? I said, oh, sure. And I'll tell you a great Joe Beck story, a typical Joe Beck story. Uh, I, we, are, we are big on tangents. That's how we run. Yeah, right. Uh, the show has so, no form to it. So Brian Alsop missed a session with Joey Levine. They called me to run in and do it. Joe Beck, I had never met him before. It was the very first time said to me, you know, you came in here, you read this thing down per- perfectly, you should charge double scale. <laughs> it was my third session, Chris. So I go, oh, Joe knows best, <laughs> double scale. Well, I got paid single scale, and I never heard from Joey Levine ever again. <laughs> but getting back, that, that, that now being called a Beck Sanborn record, was an incredible record. How New York session, quote unquote, that really was and what great material can you sort of reflect on that well 
uh, McKell's, the, the famous club, Pat and Mike McKell, uh, we had a band. We had the um, uh, Will and Don Gronick and I all lived in the same building, and Steve Kahn lived up the street, and we had the Carmine Street Band, and we would play at McKell's. Joe Beck came in and wanted a band to do a gig there, and he had us come, and he had Sanborn join us. So we did a bunch of gigs at McKell's as the Joe Beck Band with Sanborn, and Will, Don, and I. So we were very comfortable with each other. And and he got this gig to arrange for Esther Phillips. And I had done some work with Pee Wee Ellis and Esther Phillips. And I think we did the What a Difference a Day Makes session. Right. Basically the same cast. That was Esther Phillips, What a Difference a Day Makes. Joe Beck did the arrangement, played on it, and so did our guest, Chris Parker. This is Notes from an Artist on SidnessRadio.com. And then Creed asked Joe to do his own album. So same band and edition of Sanborn and stuff. And we and he had written these tunes and we were in a groove. We loved playing with each other and had a good feel. And um, that's how it happened. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, great record. And along with that, you're right about the groove because then, of course, you were with the Breckers. That was If You Want a Boogie off the second Brecker Brothers album, Back to Back. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. And then Sanborn's taken off. Butterfat is a killer tune. And it was really all around the same time. And uh, a lot of us uh, younger cats, not by much, but younger, uh, <laughs> would just sit there and go, how the hell did they do that? It was a groove. It was, uh, that was uh, Steve Kahn's tune, Butterfat, that he brought in for, for Sanborn's first record. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. And then, of course, uh, there's, uh, we, we, can't, we have to talk at length about stuff. We, um, we talked with George Porter uh, a few weeks ago, right, David? And yes. you were opening up for the meters somewhere. And George, uh, you, yeah, I don't think the record was even out yet. And George Porter ran back to the rest of the meters in a panic, saying, what are we going to play? These guys just played everything. <laughs> we related to, actually, George, is, uh, you know, you you were the meters of New, New York, York City. And the same thing, just like Booker T represented Memphis, uh, the Swampers, obviously, Muscle Shoals, the Wrecking Crew, even though that wasn't their real name in L.A. But Stuff was that quintessential... New York ensemble, it just sounded like New York City. If you were in New York City in the 1970s, Stuff was the soundtrack to the city. What was it? What what made Stuff so special? Well, uh, the personalities, I think, made it special. You know, um, everybody got along really well and sort of complimented each other. I think in the, the liner notes to the CD that I produced called The Right Stuff, which is like a compilation of the stuff albums, you know, I talk about the, the approach being an orchestral approach to, to the group. And um, to elaborate on that, it's like everybody had a, a role to play, you know, and, and Gordon always uh, used the metaphor of a football team, you know, that he was the quarterback and uh, somebody hiked the ball to him and he was going to do something, throw a pass or do a run or do a Hail Mary or, you know, whatever analogy works. And we were uh, either the blockers or the we would run defense or we would, you know, so the football analogy really works and the orchestral analogy really works for me too, you know, because we were all um, sensitive to each other. Although we never discussed, you know, uh, like Steve and I never discussed, you You go to the bell on okay. the bridge, play cross stick up until this point, and then you play 16s on the hi-hat, and then, you know, double up on the bass drum when we get to the coda. We never discussed a single note about what we were going to play. It all just happened organically. And the same thing with Eric and Cornell, play rhythm and I'll play lead, but they deferred to each other musically. You know, whatever was happening musically. And Richard T was uh, was the glue for everybody. You know, he was the resident genius. I mean, they were all, you know, Cornell was a genius. Eric was a genius. Uh, but locking in with Richard and Gordon was like the, the key thing for me, you know. And Gordon was the leader of the band. And you had to keep your eyes on him in terms of what, what was going to happen next. You know, he would... He would uh, suddenly talk about tangents, suddenly go off, you know, into A minor from whatever we were playing, you know, and we would sit there for a while until he said, we're going to D and then we're going to G, you know, he would, he, without 
saying a word, you know, or without giving a signal, you know, we're going this way or up a third or whatever. So everybody kept their eyes on Gordon in terms of what we were going to play, what tempo it was going to be, and uh, what we were going to play next. There was never a set list. There was never, um, you know, we're going to cover this material because this is on the first CD or we're going to yeah. we're going to cover for the first album rather it was always his his call he was really the leader and it was up to him to decide you know what happened next and at what tempo it happened and so each personality i don't know if it's astrological richard cornell and i were all sagittarian steve is aries eric i forget but somehow the fire and the air and the, the water all mixed together and i mean that sounds really lame you know astrologically <laughs> But uh, it was really the personalities that worked together. You know, we deferred to each other. We complimented each other. We, at least for my part, uh, you yeah. know, respect everybody's playing. There was no slouch in the band. There was no dead weight. There was no nobody who couldn't hold their own if he was past the ball. You know, if the ball was thrown to him, he could make a touchdown. That was stuffed live at McKell's. I was there almost every time they played. And that was Ode to Billy Joe. This is Notes from an Artist. CygnusRadio.com. If the the ball was handed off to uh, to Eric Gale or to Cornell, you know, all right, just get, you know, Gordon would stop everybody else and let it be just the two guitars. Everybody pulled their weight and everybody um, really complimented each other, you know, and and dug each other. Everybody dug what individually we were doing. Well, it's kind uh, of interesting because stuff was a comp a compilation of of band leaders. Everybody was a band leader in their own right. I mean, all all those all of you have put out solo records and led bands so yep. you know. it also defined the sound of New York because if you think about it as I said the Beck and Sanborn the Brecker Brothers stuff John Tropez group that was Muff by the John Trope band on his first album and I must tell you I had the thrill of being able to play that chart with John uh, must have been like 15 years later up in the Hudson House in Nyack what a cool gig this is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com it all held together and it really defined exactly what was, it is a piece in time. I mean, if you had a time capsule from, let's say, 1977 and you opened it up, you could put any one of these records on and it would really just bring you right back there. I remember sitting in the front rows watching Gordon and it always it always freaked me out. How come he's never going up the neck? How come he's just <laughs> down there? And then... Richard would do his thing, and I'm going, I quit the bass. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> that again was stuff. Do you want some of this from their very first record? This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. It was just the funkiest thing. It, it, yeah. it really was remarkable. And obviously, you guys, there were some days you were there. There were some days Steve was there. Some days you were both there. How great it was that you had Pat's place play literally all the time. It was great. It was great. You know, when we started there, Pat had music on the weekend. He had Art Blakey or Art Farmer or Chico Hamilton or Roy Haynes, uh, total jazz acts, I guess, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But there was nothing happening, at least that I was aware of, from Sunday to Wednesday. And Gordon asked Pat, you know, give me the slowest time of the week and let me do this. So we started backing up Esther Marrow, Queen Esther, they call her. She had a, a set that she did and we would play in between. And it gradually evolved, you know, that we did more and more sets. That was Esther Marrow doing Rainy Night in Georgia with a couple of the guys that ended up in Stuff. Namely, Gordon Edwards on bass and Cornell Dupree on guitar. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. The material was, you know, what we heard on the jukebox, what we heard on the radio, Stevie Wonder tunes and Earth, right. Wind and & Fire, and also tunes that Cornell had played on, like uh, Rainy Night in Georgia, or tunes that Eric had played on, um, uh, Reverend Lee, Roberta Flack tunes, uh, Gone Away, and, and whatever else came to mind, literally, whatever else, you know, Richard and Gordon and Cornell, it was originally just the four of us, you know, oh, and there was a, a tenor player, Charlie Brown, but the four of us would play, you know, whether it was Carol King up on the roof or, um, oh, geez, all kinds of stuff, whatever, whatever came to mind, you know, oh, yeah, let's try that instrumentally, take this orchestral approach that I was talking to 
talking about to this particular tune. And, you know, and Cornell would take the melody, or Richard would take the melody, Billy Preston tunes, Stevie Wonder tunes. Um, Cornell had been working with King Curtis a lot, you know, backing Aretha. So there was, we didn't play a lot of Aretha material, but there was King Curtis things, you know, like uh, Chicken Shack and Soul well, Serenade. Serenade. Yeah. Um, some great tunes that were, were already instrumental tunes. So it was no stretch for us to play them instrumentally. That was Stuff live at the bottom line on New Year's Eve, 1976, doing That's the Way of the World, Earth, Wind, and Fire. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. I started to write thinking, uh, you know, that I got to write some tunes for this band and what would be good. So I, I brought in a bunch of tunes. Richard started to write. Richard and Gordon wrote together stuff that's on the first album stuff. The things that are on the first album, you know, uh, Gordon and Richard rented a hotel room, uh, I think the Sheraton along the West Side Highway, and they moved the Rhodes piano in there and Gordon had his bass and amp. And they sat there for a couple of weeks and came up with this material, you know, and some of it we had been playing live and some of it they wrote on the spot like uh do you want some of this and a bunch of different things and cornell wrote tunes and eric gale had already written how long will it last right that was on i think a chuck rainey coalition album so there were there was this body of material you know that we would play and pat said yeah Come back the next night. We would do Sunday through Wednesday and as long as we want. You know, we used to do four or five sets, you know, and leave there at four in the morning, depending on if we had a 10 o'clock jingle the next morning. Oh, I got a, I got a split <laughs> <laughs> at 10 o'clock because there was so much work. You know, there was so much work going around. This was a great place. Thanks to Pat and Mike, you know, to stretch out and play what you didn't get to play on the record date or what you didn't get to play on the movie soundtrack that you were working on. Uh, it was a great time in that respect. Yeah, and that first album, we were talking with uh, John Montagna. I don't know if you know who he sure. is. Sure, okay, yeah. so, okay. So John and I are, are, are firm believers that that first record should be given to every aspiring musician going into a music school. Once again, it, it was that was a real important record for me because I, I always was playing with chops. It's kind of like, whoa, whoa, hold down. This is a groove. And it, it, it you can play quarter notes, played, David. You can play quarter notes. But it really changed my perspective. And I think it's an important thing for most musicians to understand that that space is wonderful. Gordon always said you make more money playing less notes. Well, you know what they say? Upper register, cash register. <laughs> great that's good too but stuff is still relevant i mean i i occasionally come across stuff samples every once in a while my wife and i will tune into hot 100 or whatever you know just to see what the kids are listening to and i'm like damn if that doesn't sound like a stuff groove i don't know what does so i mean it's not like these yes these records are time capsules but they still sound fresh and invigorating almost 50 years later that was Stuff, live in Montreux, doing the Stevie Wonder classic, signed, sealed, and delivered. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Well, at the risk of, the risk of sound arrogance, you know, the, the way we approach R&B tunes and standards and stuff, playing them instrumentally, then became CD 101, the format. You know, here's right. a guitar player, uh, a piano player who's using the Rhodes small stone to get that road sound that Richard got. They're playing a Stevie Wonder tune or they're playing, you know, uh, uh, John Denver tune, <laughs> you know, instrumentally. And that's still uh, one of the serious stations, watercolors or one of those. Right. right. You know, that's their format. They play sometimes it's two guitars or there's certainly a rhythm guitar player and lead guitar player in this uh, formulaic groove. But nobody was doing that before stuff that I know of. And we kind of um, made that okay. You know, it's okay to play That's the Way of the World instrumentally. It's okay to play Overjoyed instrumentally. You know, Stevie Wonder tunes, whatever it was. Or Stephen Stills, love the one you're with. It's okay to play those instrumentally and people will recognize it and, and dig it because it's such a great song. I think what stuff did, along with, I guess, the Saturday Night Live band, and uh, uh, Paul Schaefer, the world's most dangerous band, is bring right. that rhythm and blues into the American songbook because that wasn't, you know, that was teenagers' music. And then all of a sudden, you know, I being a teenager when Saturday Night Live and I saw stuff with Joe Cocker at the Calderon <laughs> Festival, 
quite a show. But that generation, what you guys were doing is you were augmenting the American songbook. And now those songs are part of our culture. The Lexus. When I write for Huffington Post, I always say those bands deserve entry into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which, you know, has its misgivings, but they should be recognized for that because that was a very important role, you guys. Yep, I agree. And I also think you uh, made people go back to the original records, too. They go, oh, what did this sound oh, like? Oh, yeah, because I was too young to get those original records. So then I'd go back and go, damn, listen to that. Wow, that's where that came from. Yeah, I, I, I keep the kid around. Just uh, Yeah, I'm a 61-year-old young. kid. I'm the, I'm the young chippy on the block here. <laughs> <laughs> I get David's coffee. He makes me go out and run on a coffee room. <laughs> Which is a long commute since he lives in the Bronx, you know. Yes, and I polish his base. I polish his extended range bases. <laughs> Would you believe it? I... He gave me a four-string bass. I haven't had a four-string bass. I gave him a Fender Precision. Okay, it's one of those things in the back over there. I think Gordon Ed, that's my Gordon Edwards bass. You see, I call it my George Porter Gordon Edwards bass because it has four uh, strings, frets, and scars on it from people throwing shit at it. I have a Fender Precision myself. That's a, I wrote a lot of tunes on a Fender Precision. Yeah. There you go. Well, David, would you be open to some lessons from Chris Parker, perhaps? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, the four-string bass, I'm, I'm playing Chris. it Teach like a ukulele. Because, you know, those six-string basses are, are fat-ass, but... In any event, what was expected of studio players in the 70s? Really the golden age of studio music. And, and it's one that a lot of modern players still reference. But how did you prepare yourself? I mean, you, you had to have been educated. You had to have been a reader. Yeah, that's still the same today as, as far as I know. You know, uh, being able to read well and to adapt yourself to whatever situation you're in. You know, backing up a singer or playing with a jazz artist or playing with uh, whatever style they're asking for you know being a, a musicologist right. in terms of able to uh reference different kinds of music i mean that was always my my approach somebody says it's this style or that style you know and having a particular tune in mind that i could reference and say oh okay well let me do a, this kind of feel on it because that might work and then getting taking direction change up whatever you're doing and being uh diplomatic about it you know a lot of times people expect the the drums to change everything and um it's a tough concept to explain you know in a few minutes between takes that everybody's got to change you know i'll i'll change my groove but everybody else has got to be willing and or i've got to be able to talk them into you know let's go in this direction or let's kind of shuffle the eighth notes a little bit or let's kind of lay back in this second and doing that in, in a way that everybody says or the you know relevant players say okay i'll try that and i was often on the receiving end chris can you do something a little different here can you add this kind of uh, inflection to it if you don't get the music and it's you know doing it by feel or by groove you know that's a that's a different thing you know you're playing with a bunch of cats in the studio that doesn't happen so much anymore usually you've got a piece of music they've sent you an mp3 they have a right. demo of often with machine drums or with a sequence or something. So you're uh, immediately put in this metronomic state of mind. You know, it's it's to the metronome. It's right square in the center of the beat. But when they get into the studio, depending on the singer or something, they don't really want metronomic. They want something that feels good. So what feels good is often a little behind the beat. You know, Donald Fagan and Walter would... <laughs> <laughs> micro microscope this you know how many milliseconds exactly is it set you know and i think on um on the dunes or counter moon or trans himalayan one of the tunes i played with on donald's album you know it was 70 milliseconds is what really felt good so 70 milliseconds the, the backbeat has got to be 70 milliseconds behind you know, the square. And he was right. That was Donald Fagan doing Counter Moon with our guest, Chris Parker on drums. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. You yep. know, and Walt and Donald were great that way, you know, to analyze things and to take it through this whole analysis and then come back to this musical, musical interpretation. It's a question when you get in the studio of, you know, being able to read, being able to uh, use detente or... Um, <laughs> diplomatic approach to whatever's going on. Ron Carter, you 
mentioned before, you know, who's a brilliant musician, you know, he and I worked on a Sinead O'Connor record, and he was a, a lesson in diplomacy and in artistry, and he was so cool and so musical, and everything he played was wonderful, you know, and he never, he was totally unflappable. One, two. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I think we did Saturday Night Live, too. You know, she did the, the things that we played on, we did live for the show. It's where she rips up the picture of the Pope just before. Oh, right. Right. right, that got yeah. a, a little bit of attention, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why Ron has had the career he's had. Not only brilliant musician and brilliant reader and great composer, but this kind of demeanor that lends itself to musical creativity and to the goal of everyone being part of this process with the goal being, we're going to produce this document of this performance. You know, we're going to make this performance as good as it possibly can be. And we're going to document it by recording it so that you will be able to reference these moments and these uh, intertwining of creative spirits. That makes a great deal of sense. And you want wonder how your role has changed with with the new technology. I think the the first quote unquote instrument, I don't know if suffer is the right word, but the um, compromise was drums with the drum machine. Yeah. How did you or did it really affect you personally? No, it it didn't affect me. I've kept on working. I embraced the technology, you know, when that started to happen, I got a Emu SP12 and I got a Lim drum and I got um, Simmons electronic drums and I got sequencers and <laughs> I had a huge rack of stuff and I was one of the first guys to be able, I mean, there's some great programmers, clearly, you know, Jimmy Braylauer and Sammy exactly. Marandino, and, but I was able to program as well as play. So there was a, I was bridging this gap between what somebody could program taking, you know, 48 hours between be, before the session to program the 16th notes on the hi-hat and the, and the bass drum feel just right, you know, and make it sound great. I could do that on the spot using the samples that I had. I had a sampler and the sequences that I could make on the spot was a big advantage. The thing was moving this rack around was, 
I couldn't move it by myself. I had to have, you know, a cartage service come and set it up eight miles of MIDI cables and all this stuff. I mean, that was the, the unglamorous part of it. When we actually got to the playing and triggering and stuff like that, it was fun. You know, this is so cool. I can trigger a sample of a snare drum from the uh, electric light orchestra or Jeff Lynn's, you know, giant snare drum i can trigger that or i can tune it way up so it's a giant snare drum but it sounds like a like a bongo you know i mean right. endless possibilities with the stuff so it was fun you know and then it sort of the pendulum swung back and people wanted to hear live drums played by a live guy by so now we're in this place where anything goes you know you can sequence you can use a drum machine you can take a, all these rap records you know use a sample whoever clyde stubblefield funky drummer or Purdy or uh, so anything goes and it's fine. You can't stop the march of technology or the march of creativity or the evolution of, of music. All this stuff is different. I don't particularly, you know, care about a lot of the artists that are putting out records. I know they're hit records. The hit record doesn't make me want to follow them as an artist, as opposed to 70s and 80s, where James Taylor or Earth, Wind and Fire would make a record and you love the record so much you can't wait till the next record comes out because you want to follow what that artist is doing creatively. That's actually a conversation David and I had uh, with John Alt and I think with Ben Neal is one of the difficulties I think we have with following, I guess, this new K-pop phenomenon. And look at us, David, we're sounding so old now, is that um, these new electronic artists, and you're right, they are technology is marching forward, but they don't use the same song format that we're used to hearing. For example, everyone from Lena Horne to David Bowie use the AABA standard song form. Everyone from Robert Cray to the Rolling Stones to How and Wolf to use a 12-bar blues format and, or, and permutations there. But at least you could listen, I could listen to someone like John Legend, who's not the newest artist, but I say, okay, yeah, that's Earth, Wind, and Fire, that's Stevie Wonder. Lady Gaga is using the same language that Carol King used, that Laura Nero used. But K-pop and permutations thereof and, and the electronic music, there are no intros, there are no choruses. And a matter of fact, Ben Neal, David, was saying it's more about the, the tone. There are certain sounds that are the hook. It's not the melody it's not the drum fill that you're waiting for right it's it's the sound it's that tone and it's programmed every seven seconds because algorithms tell you that the human brain responds to a certain sound so it's they're using a different language than we're used to hearing you know? and don't yep. forget auto-tune and auto-tune which is acceptable now i agree it's uh it's much more about textures than song form or lyrics or any of the criteria that we're used to using you know it's a texture that's a cool texture that's a cool sample of a drum machine to me country what they call country now is what rock was in the 80s and 90s you know there are songs there are hooks and, and all the technology is in use there are some some good things you know some musical things it's not all truck drivers and double wides <laughs> <laughs> well listen if these guys grew up and these girls grew up on pad benatar the arrhythmics well, that's what they're going to reflect in their music right when you go to work with legends when you go to work with somebody like a, a Bob Dylan or a Miles or an Aretha, do you ever do any research ahead of time just to go back and listen to their canon? Although with those artists, I mean, it's pretty much, uh, you know, everyone knows that stuff. But even even artists such as John Cicada, do you ever do that or do you like to go into a fresh uh, a session fresh? With with Miles, Aretha and and Bob Dylan, I, I grew up with that music. Sure. And I was a, and um, well, actually, I wasn't a fan of Bob Dylan until I started working with him. But I was a huge fan of Aretha and Muscle Shoals and fan of Miles from all those records with Ron Carter and Tony Williams and Jimmy Cobb. And, you know, that's the music I grew up with that was always playing in my house. That was Aretha Franklin doing It's Gonna Get a Bit Better from her album in 1979, La Diva. And that had Chris Parker on drums, our special guest. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Wow. Well, we let you know at the beginning of the show that this was going to be a two-parter. So that's all for tonight. I want to thank my co-host, Tom Samioli, and of course, Chris Parker for a sparkling interview. And don't forget to keep an eye out for his new Chris Parker Trio recording. I also want to let you know that we are being sponsored by DR Strings. Where else would you be able to get pink neon strings for a six-string bass? They have some of the best strings out there today, so go check them out. And I also want to let you know that we are archiving all of our shows via our podcast, also titled 
Notes from an Artist, which you can find on all major podcast players or at notesfromanartist.buzzsprout.com. This is David Gross with co-host Tom Semioli. Thanking you for listening. Have a great week and come back next Monday to listen to part two of the Chris Parker interview. Take care. Take care.